Well, welcome to this, another word from the word brought to you by your friends here at the Madeiraville Assembly of God. Know that we pray for you. We're so thankful for our on, online listeners. We're glad that you could join us for this chapter by chapter study of God's word, the Bible. Have your Bibles ready. We'll be reading today from Mark chapter 10. In this chapter, we'll be seeing a number of paradoxes. What on earth, Pastor Tom, do you mean by a paradox? Well, I believe we'll see. A paradox is a figure of speech. It's a statement that seems to contradict itself, but is nonetheless true. Here's some examples of paradoxes that we'll find as we read Mark 10. And perhaps as you listen, you'll hear some more. Two joined together become one. That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? But it's true. Adults must become like little children. How is that? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. That doesn't really seem to make sense, but it's, it's true. One achieves greatness by becoming a servant. How does that work? And even we'll see at the very end that a blind man may truly see. Just how is that? Keep listening as we read, and maybe you'll pick up on some more of them. Now, as we begin this chapter, we see that the Pharisees are trying to once again, quote-unquote, tempt Jesus. It says in verse 1, And he arose from thence, and cometh into the coasts of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again, and as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? Now they've tried this on a number of occasions, and this time they, they're trying to involve him in the divorce controversy of that day. What are the scriptural grounds for divorce and remarriage? And it was a hot topic then, and it's been a hot topic since then. Controversial. The two main schools of thought then came from two very popular Jewish rabbis. One group followed Rabbi Shammai. Uh, they were very conservative, believing that there was only one biblical ground for divorce and remarriage, sexual immorality. And that would have been a little closer to the truth of the word of God. The other rabbi was Hillel. He was more of a religious liberal. He taught that divorce could be for almost any reason. Those reasons could include some things that seem very trivial even by today's standards. She, she burned the food. She went outside with her hair disheveled or messed up. He found someone more attractive. Even she had bad breath. Now, if Jesus sided with Rabbi Shammai, the followers of Hillel in his audience would shun him. If he sided with Hillel, the followers of Shammai would shun him. Both groups would probably accuse Jesus of violating the word of God. Those Pharisees thought they had a perfect plan to alienate Jesus from his followers, perhaps to turn the tide against him. But Jesus would not take their bait and get involved in their controversy. The question was asked if a divorce is never God's plan, and I don't believe it ever is God's perfect will and plan. Why was there allowance for divorce in the Old Testament? Uh, Moses, you must probably no spoke about giving the one who was divorced a, a writing of divorcement, a paper indicating that they'd been divorced. Now, how did Jesus answer that question? Well, we'll see. So we begin with verse 3. We ask if divorce is not God's plan, and I don't believe that it ever is, why was there allowance made for it in the Old Testament? Well, verse 3 says, He answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. Jesus took them right to the word of God. What did Moses command about divorce? Well, first we must note that Moses never commanded them to get a divorce. Only what to do in the sad case that it happened. He said to give her a writing of divorcement, and this is from Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes. Why? Well, because he has found some uncleanness in her. And that, that word uncleanness is where the big controversy with the rabbis came about. What, what was meant by uncleanness? Is it just sexual immorality? 
And I believe that's actually what the word means. Or can it be almost anything that does not please him, as the more liberal group believed? Then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she's departed out of the house, she may go and be another man's wife because she has this paper that allows her to be married again. So in very limited circumstances under Old Testament law, there was allowance made for the sad event of divorce if it happened. Yet God never intended for divorce. It was never his plan. In fact, the book of Malachi says that he hates it. He hates putting away. And I know that anyone who's ever been through that horrible heartache has probably been able to say the same thing. They hate it too. Even though it was never God's plan, never his perfect will, he did make provision for what would happen in the sad event that it did occur. Jesus said that when it did happen, it would always be because of the hardness of the human heart. It could be the hardness of a heart that committed adultery against their mate, or the hardness of a heart that would not be forgiving and, and merciful. This is the same reason I believe we find polygamy in the Old Testament. Even though it was never, of course, God's plan from the beginning, they often had multiple wives. It was not because God ordained that or God condoned it, but because their hearts were hard. If you're married today, pray that God would keep your heart and the heart of your spouse soft and tender toward God and toward one another. You see, it's not about finding a loophole for getting out of a marriage. It's about asking God for help in strengthening the marriage that's there. So Moses allowed for divorce under limited circumstances because of the hardness of their hearts. But Jesus takes the matter back much further than Moses, right to creation, God's original model and plan for marriage in Genesis, what we've called before the Genesis model. Verse 6, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female, and that's still God's plan. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then there shall, they are no more twain, but one flesh. And there's one of those paradoxes, two become one. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, this scripture tells us what constitutes, constitutes the covenant of marriage. Marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman. No other combination, regardless of our present culture, is a marriage. Uh, every human being at the point of conception is either male or female. There are only two genders. And it takes one from each of those two genders to make a marriage. No other combination is allowed. Marriage involves leaving father and mother. According to Genesis, we, we still love and honor our parents, but marriage creates a new family. Once we're married, our mate takes precedence over our parents. We still love them. We still honor them. Uh, but if it comes right down to it, we must know that our mates take precedence. We cleave together in marriage. It's the idea of gluing something together is what the word means. I'm told that if boards are glued together, with wood glue, that the cleaving of the gluing together is stronger than the wood itself. If you try to pull those glued boards apart, the wood will rip before the cleaving does. In the same way, divorce rips and tears at the wood of our lives. Anyone who's experienced it knows that very well. We become one flesh in marriage. Here is one of those paradoxes. How can two become one? It's indeed a mystery. The word one is the same word used in the Shema found in Deuteronomy. That's that, that saying that, that Jews repeat as kind of their statement of faith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So in some mysterious way, husband and wife become one, just as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are one. We have one new thing, a marriage, a home, yet two people. A paradox, but a truth. We dare not tear a marriage apart because we're not the ones who created it. God is the one who joins a husband and wife together. Marriage is not just a piece of paper. It's not just another human contract. It is something created by a divine miracle. Now, even the disciples were a bit unsure about Jesus' stand on marriage and divorce. We read their words here and also in the parallel passage in Matthew 19.
So the disciples have more questions about marriage. Verse 10, And in the house his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he said unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Some have said that in Bible days a woman could not divorce her husband, only the other way around. Now, Jesus seems to indicate otherwise because he speaks of a woman putting away her husband. The disciples truly wanted to know the truth of the matter. I don't believe the Pharisees wanted to know the truth. They just wanted to start controversy and trouble. Now, here again, it's a place where having a harmony of the Gospels in hand is valuable. The harmony of the Gospels shows us side by side the parallel passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and sometimes John. Well, here is some of the parallel passage in Matthew 19, beginning at verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. So Jesus gives a ground there uh, for possible marriage and, or for possible divorce and remarriage, fornication or adultery. And shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which are so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which are made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So Jesus gave an exception, except it be for fornication, that is sexual immorality. Uh, so one ground for divorce and remarriage is adultery. We could perhaps build a case for another from 1 Corinthians. If an unbeliever refuses to remain with a believer uh, and departs, the believer is no longer bound. If the unbeliever is willing to remain, though, the believers should do all in their power to keep the marriage intact. Perhaps they'll win the unbelieving spouse to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when the disciples heard how binding the marriage covenant really is, they, they surmised that it might be advisable just to forgo marriage altogether. And as wonderful as marriage is, and marriage is God's plan, God's covenant for most people, that they have a point. In the parallel passage in Matthew 19, Jesus did speak of several who might not want to get married. He, he called them eunuchs, ones who could not marry in this context. He said some were born with some kind of condition that would preclude them from being married. Some are made eunuchs. That was done in those days. Eunuchs were those who were surgically altered in order to keep kings, harems, etc. And as strange as it seems today, it was common practice back then. And then still others might choose to remain unmarried for the kingdom of God's sake. That might mean that they chose to remain single to devote their whole time and life to ministry. Paul seems to have been in that category, though he was married at one time. Uh, some might not feel that they have a biblical right to remarry and might remain single. And this is an individual thing as one uh, comes to the word of God and allows the Holy Spirit to direct their lives. The main thought is this. Keep your heart soft. Remember and never forget the sanctity of marriage. Remember that it is not the state of Indiana or a piece of paper that actually puts people together. It is God himself. Don't look for loopholes to quit. Look for his help in making it work. Not only should we strive to have soft hearts, but we should also seek to be childlike in our temperament. Jesus says that we are to become as little children. Suffer the little children to come unto me, we're told. Verse 13, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me. And forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Why did the disciples rebuke those who brought children to Jesus? Well, it was because partly children were considered the lowest level of society. 
It was not fitting that a man of Jesus' stature should be, quote, unquote, bothered with little children. You know, we used to hear the saying, children should be seen and not heard. Well, it was certainly in effect then. But Jesus certainly did not view children as second-class citizens or the lowest level in the family of God. He honored them. Jesus blessed them. Now, there's nothing at all, I don't believe, in the Bible that suggests infant baptism, but we do dedicate infants to the Lord. The language here seems to indicate something along the, the lines of him dedicating them, blessing them. Becoming a child or like a child would mean having a simple trusting attitude toward the Lord. Simple childlike faith. We receive ch salvation in simple childlike faith. This would also indicate to us that young children are in a state of grace, perhaps because we, we must become like them if we intend to make heaven our home. Uh, does a little child that, that dies before that, that age of accountability, whatever that might be, are they going to heaven? Well, I believe they, they must be because Jesus said we must become like them if we plan to go to heaven. This is also an important scripture for children's ministry. The vast majority of those who are saved are saved before they reach the age of 14. Another study found that 94% of those who are saved are saved before they reach the age of 18. So I don't mind hearing a baby crying or a toddler getting a bit fussy in church. We should all say, suffer the little children to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. They're important to Jesus, and they must be important to us as well. Now next, Jesus encounters a man that we commonly call the rich young ruler. Verse 17, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But I believe the rich young ruler was perhaps making the affirmation that he did know that Jesus was the Son of God. We don't know. Verse 19, Thou knowest the commandments, Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Oh, I love that. Jesus loves us even when we don't quite get it. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up thy cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now, religion asks, what do I have to do to earn salvation? Christianity affirms, look in faith to what Jesus has already done on the cross. And in looking to him, we're saved. This man believed that he was probably okay because he truly believed that he had kept God's commandments. Perhaps he needed to hear the words of James 2.10, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. But Jesus went down a list of commandments, and he could say check to each of them. Do not commit adultery. Well, I've never done that. Check. Honor your father and mother. Father and mother, check. And on down the list, he checked them all off, and at that point, he must have been a little bit proud of himself. Then Jesus began to dig a little deeper. If you've done all that, then sell what you have and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. You see, he could not see fit to do that. He could not keep the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet. He had a covetous heart. And of course, Jesus knew that and gave that particular commandment in order to show him the futility of trying to earn his way by keeping the commandments. I personally don't believe that this is a command for every one of us to sell what we have and give to the poor, as wonderful as that might be. But it is a scripture that reminds us that no matter how righteous we believe that we are and how deserving we think that we are, Jesus sees the heart and there is something that we're dealing with if the truth be known. In his case, it was covetousness. Jesus got right to the heart of the matter. It would do us well to remember the words not only of James 2.10, but also those of Ephesians 2. Salvation is not of works, lest any man should boast. If you can boast about it, it's not true Bible salvation. 
if you can boast about it. We can't earn salvation because salvation is a supernatural act. It's miraculous. Beginning at verse 23, Jesus looked around about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Not that they won't, but they'll do so with difficulty, great difficulty. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, What then, or who then, can be saved? Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Now the disciples were astonished at Jesus' words, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, because many believed in those days that riches were a sign of God's blessing on a life. So if a person was rich, it must mean they'd been blessed by God, and surely a person so blessed would be saved. But Jesus said that one who trusted in their riches would be saved with great difficulty. He said it would be more difficult than that of a camel going through the eye of a needle. Now sometimes you'll hear it said, and I've heard this over the years, that that meant a smaller gate within the large gate of a city, that they had a small gate within the large city gate, and when that gate was closed at night, if you were a traveler coming through, there was just room to squeak through with your camel, but you had to leave your possessions outside. It makes a good illustration, but there's not any evidence really that I can find that it's true. So what does Jesus mean by that? Well, the smallest opening they could think of was the eye of a needle, and the largest animal they were familiar with was a camel. So it would be impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Humanly speaking, it's just as impossible for anyone to be saved outside of a miracle. The whole idea is salvation involves a miracle of God. You, you can't earn it. You can't merit it. It's, it's nothing you can do. I remember the words of a song I heard when I was a child. It took a miracle to put the stars in place. It took a miracle to hang the world in space. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Praise God, it took a miracle to save me. I, I couldn't earn my salvation. I couldn't merit my salvation. In fact, naturally speaking, it was impossible for someone like me to be saved. But with God, all things are possible. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. As for earthly riches, we may not see them here, but we have a promise of great reward as we live faithfully for him. Verse 28 says, Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, that there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive an hundredfold now, and this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life, but many that are first shall be last, and the last first. There's another one of those paradoxes, the first last and the last first. Now Peter was correct. Those who followed Jesus had given up a great deal to follow him. You know, the rich young ruler was not willing to give up that which was very most important to him, but Peter and the others had left a lot to follow Jesus, and it had not gone unnoticed by the Lord. Jesus makes it clear that if we're willing to sacrifice for him, that we haven't really lost anything. We've, we've gained something far greater now, and an eternity. You see, our way of looking at greatness is not the same as the world's. In this world, greatness is measured by power, by bank account, by popularity. In God's kingdom, greatness is measured by obedience and servanthood. Now, there again, here's one of those paradoxes. There are those who seem to be first now, but they well may be the last. The rich young ruler seemed to have everything. He seemed to be first, but he really had nothing. The disciples seemed to have nothing. They had given up all to follow Jesus, but in reality, they were the rich ones. Now, it's at this point that we see Jesus making his way to Jerusalem for the last time. Now, Isaiah 57 speaks of that prophetically. Jesus setting him, his face like flint, adamantly, determinedly going 
uh, to Jerusalem. Isaiah 57, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. He's determined to go. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. So Jesus sets his face like flint for Jerusalem. And we see this in Mark 10, 32. They were in the way going up to Jerusalem and Jesus went before them. You know, Jesus takes the lead. He's, he's going, knowing full well what's going to be happening. And they were amazed. You know, they were amazed at Jesus going to Jerusalem in light of what was about to happen. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. And everything, of course, happened just exactly like that. He knew it was time. He's going willingly. He's going before the disciples. Another Old Testament scripture that speaks prophetically of his attitude in going to Jerusalem to the cross is Psalm 40 and 7. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do thy will. O oh my God, yea, thy law is written in my heart, within my heart. It was a time of great sorrow, but also great joy. Hebrews 12 tells us that he went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. The joy of obedience, the joy of redeeming his bride, the church. Those words from Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, while Jesus had his face set like flint to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die, all the disciples still seem to have on their minds is who will be the greatest among them. They still don't quite get it. And he begins to teach them once again about true greatness. What is true greatness in the kingdom of God? And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would you that I would do for you, should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall you be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, of course, James and John were brothers. But we find from the parallel passage in Matthew 20, 20 and 21, that it was actually their mother who put them up to this. You know, she wanted her sons to be sitting in those prominent positions. But they still had worldly ideas about what greatness really was, what his kingdom was all about. And even the other disciples that, that really uh, were angry because they had made this request, that they didn't get it either. They were still looking for an earthly kingdom, earthly leadership. The idea of Jesus dying, rising again, ascending to heaven, sending the Holy Spirit, followed by a long church age that we're living in now was something they couldn't yet comprehend or see. Jesus said to them, James and John, you, you don't know what you're asking. Are you, you able to drink of the cup that I'm going to drink? That's a cup of suffering, death. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with and He's speaking about being immersed into suffering. And they say, we, we can, we're able. 
Uh, they were going into it with their eyes open at this time. They, they would suffer. In fact, James would be the first of the twelve to give his life as a martyr. And you can find that in Acts chapter 12. John would be the only one of the twelve not to die a martyr's death. He would live to an old age, but not without great suffering for the cause of Christ. There's an ancient tradition that claims he survived an attempt on his life by boiling oil, and that would be indeed great suffering for the cause of Christ. In the world's kingdoms, greatness is measured and determined by totally different standard. Gentiles or unsaved leaders rule over other people. Disciples, your leadership in my kingdom is not going to be ruling over other people, but leading them as shepherds, serving them as servants, ministering to them. The, the word minister here was used of a lowly servant who, who served tables. Your greatness will be determined by your service to others, bringing to the table the bread of life. There will be no earthly greatness, but true heavenly greatness, true spiritual greatness in your lives. Here again is one of the paradoxes we spoke up about at the beginning if you want to be great you must become a servant a table servant and that didn't seem like a contradiction but it's certainly true in God's kingdom Jesus himself gave us the example by by giving himself his own life as a ransom a payment for sin he took up his cross and we must take up our cross and follow him that's what true greatness is we'll serve God's people humbly the bread of life Finally, Mark 10 ends with a miracle, the healing of two blind men, although Mark only mentions one of them, the spokesman. Parallel passage in Matthew lets us know there were actually two. But a blind man sees. Verse 46, and they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, or great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And by that phrase, son of David, he indicated that the Lord was the Messiah. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now at this time they're getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. It's just about a day away, about 15 miles. That last leg of their trip will be a bit more strenuous, though. Jericho is 845 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is close to 2,500 feet above sea level. Uh, that will mean they'll be going uphill uh, all the way to Jerusalem. And as they're leaving that, that great city of Jericho, a great multitude of people are following. And out of that multitude comes the voice of two blind men. Mark's short book, concise and to the point, only speaks of the main spokesman of the two, the one we normally call blind Bartimaeus. He cries out for mercy, have mercy. That is, I don't deserve the least of your blessings. I'm not entitled to this, but I know that you are merciful. The crowd tries to shut him up, to shush him, but he would not be denied. The more they tried to quiet him, the louder became his cry. This is persistent faith, and we've seen it in action before. We saw it with the, uh, the woman with the issue of blood, and we've seen it with others. Jesus could hear his voice above all of the others, just as he could feel a deliberate touch above all other touches, even in a crowd. Jesus stopped. He stood still. He had the blind man called, and I love that Jesus stopped what he was doing. He was on his way to Jerusalem for the most important ministry of his earthly ministry, but he stopped in his tracks at the cry of faith. Bartimaeus threw his outer cloak off, probably to get there faster. He rose up and came to Jesus, probably been sitting along the road begging for coins. That's what blind people did. Sometimes Jesus laid hands on people. Sometimes he spoke the word. Sometimes 
So we've seen before he made clay, he spit, he did all kinds of things to bring healing. But this time, Bartimaeus just obeyed him in faith, and as he went, he could see. Here's another paradox. Here's a man, Bartimaeus, even when he was blind, he could still see. He knew who Jesus was. He was blind, but he could still see. Others can see, but they're blind. You know, the Pharisees, that they could see Jesus with their eyes, but they were blind. We know from 2 Corinthians 4 that Satan is all about blinding to the truth of Jesus. If our gospel be hid, he says, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Our prayer today is that the Lord would open our eyes. Can we pray together? Father God, open our eyes to the truth of your word. May we know, Lord, what true greatness is. Not the world's greatness, but greatness of serving you and following you. May we know what it is to be a true servant leader, Lord God. To lead your people, Lord God. To be willing to serve the bread of life in humble circumstances. May you keep our hearts soft and tender towards you and toward our mates if we're married. Keep our marriages strong, Lord God. Help us not to cling to the things of this world, to cling to our own works of righteousness, but to cling to you in obedience and faith. We know that we'll receive your reward in due season. Help us to see these things, Lord, to know these things, to receive these things. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise God. Well, until we meet again next week, may God hold you in the hall of his hand. Don't forget, Jesus is coming. Maranatha.